Thank you for joining me. My name is Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia. Those who have followed my channel for quite some time now have seen how hard I've tried to put across the reason lying behind religious, criminal abuse. Now, religious criminal abuse is one of the most hidden forms of crime, the most deceptive and stealth forms of crime in our society. One of the biggest hurdles for people who try and understand why good people do bad things is how and why. And it is a very deep, complex, complicated concern. All over YouTube, people are trying to answer this question. How can good religious people turn bad? And I've done everything I can to try and answer that question since the start of this channel. see on the cover that we have a young girl with a hand over one eye. We only see half of her face, the other half. It represents fear and shame and guilt and the consequences, the damage, the violation. child sexual abuse, which is a sexual act imposed on a child who lacks emotional, maturational and cognitive development. It's the ability to lure a child into a sexual relationship and it's based upon the all-powerful and dominant position of the adult or older adolescent perpetrator is in sharp contrast to the child's aim, dependency, and subordinate position. Authority and power usually enable perpetrators, implicitly or directly, to coerce these children into sexual compliance. Sexual activity between an adult and a child it may range from exhibitionism to intercourse. It often progresses through the following spectrum of behavior. Number one, nudity. The adult parades nude around the house in front of all or some of the family members. Take, for instance, the stepfather paraded around the house nude in front of his 16 year old stepdaughter despite protests from her mother that his behaviour was provocative and seductive, but he claimed that the mother had a dirty mind, but later on the child revealed the secret of a three-year sexual relationship with the stepfather. Now this isn't uncommon, and this isn't uncommon in religious circles. Take disrobing, for instance. The adult disrobes in front of a child. This generally occurs when the child and the adult are alone. How many times have we heard this? Twice a week, while viewing television, father allowed his bathrobe to slip open, which exposed his naked body to his pre-adolescent daughter while her mother was attending a regularly scheduled meeting out of the home. These 
these things are not uncommon. Take genital exposure. The adult exposes his or her genitals to the child. And the perpetrator directs the children's attention to the genitals. This is disgraceful and disgusting, but it happens all the time. Say, for instance, a father comes into his 11-year-old daughter's bedroom where he opened the front of his pants and exposes his penis to her and requested that she rub it. How many times have we seen this on television? Now, when it comes to religious criminal abuse, I, I'm going to call it criminal abuse. I decided to call it criminal abuse because this is criminal. usually comes through access and opportunity. Sexual abuse is not a caprious, unplanned, unpredictable phenomenon. It's predictable. For the most part, the perpetrator is someone who is known to the child and who has already had access to the child. Now, you think about religious environments. I can tell you from experience, nine times out of ten, Parents can't wait to get rid of their children into the Sunday school or the child activity section. They wouldn't have a clue after their initial investigation as to how it works, what happens after that. The opportunity to engage in sexual activity is essential and can usually be equated with privacy. It usually happens behind closed doors. and the child need to be alone with each other in a room or some other convenient place or some secluded place outdoors. Although these circumstances of access and opportunity may be accidental on their first encounter and this is how it happens it seems to just happen by encounter and then escalates from there perpetrator can be expected to watch for or to create opportunities for private interaction with the child thereafter. So they begin to strategize how they're going to satisfy their criminal need. This is happening in churches and in life. Relationships of participants, for instance, who is the perpetrator likely to be? Almost always it is someone in the child's own family who has access and opportunity by residing in the home or family circle. It's a Trojan horse situation. Nine times out of ten, the abuse is coming from inside. The circle of safety. Can you imagine how that must feel on a child that's in an environment where they're supposed to feel safe, but they're not? If it's not a relative, the perpetrator may be someone given access to the child by the parents or guardian. And again, these people are hard to spot. Someone within the child's daily sphere of activities is usually the person that's going to be the perpetrator. Where do we allow children to be and with whom? I've had mothers complain to the fathers of concern about these types of things and just gone on with it only later to regret that they weren't so much as cautious as the father. Usually we let them be at home or in the homes of relatives or friends and neighbours. We also let, you know, it's funny isn't it, um, when you have this idea of calling neighbours auntie and uncle and they're not really auntie and uncle at all, they've really got nothing to do with anything, they're not auntie and uncle, they're just neighbours. 
very dangerous to give that title to somebody that's just not that. It gives them an authority, an influential authority, by way of comfort, given the title to the child. their homes are usually under the authority of adults who temporarily occupy caretaking or guardianship roles. Thus the dynamics of child sexual abuse most often involves a known adult who is in a, a legitimate power position over a child and who exploits accepted sociological patterns of dominance and authority to engage a child in sexual activity. It is impossible to overemphasize the significance of the exploitation and misuse of accepted power relationships when assessing the impact of sexual abuse on a child. Now, we have to ask ourselves, we really have to ask ourselves, how? to understand the evil nature that resides in all of us. Now, this evil nature has different restraints um, relative to different individuals and it manifests itself in different ways. And we can see where this evil nature was conceived in man by the incident that happened between the serpent and the woman. Now you may not be a believer of any of this, but if you listen it'll give you certainly give you a dynamic of how mankind begot an evil nature. And of course evil is always associated with cunning. It's predetermined. It's not by accident. Child sexual abuse is not an accident. It comes with cunning and deceit, and cleverness and planning, driven by a lust that could only be likened to the mind of the devil himself. says, doesn't it, the serpent was more cunning. It's the cunning. Cunning is a, is a neutral form of cleverness, isn't it? You can use cunning for evil, you can use cunning for good. A lot of cunning is used in the military and police government forces to take out evil. But in this case, this horrible case, the cunning was used to concept evil. <clears throat> I just want to show you something quickly. I want to wrap this up as a 15 minute talk. But you'll see that right up before this, if you go back to chapter 2, and we'll quickly do that, chapter 2, and we go through chapter 2, you see that God's introduced before man's created just as God then God, God, and then the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God, in verse 4, there's a divine introduction to God. He's now called the Lord God. It goes, the Lord God, I want you to pay 
very special attention here because this is the stuff that you learn in the catacombs of theology, like the catacombs, where they're truly trying to find the answer to evil. Lord God once, Lord God twice, Lord God three times, and he formed man of the dust of the ground. Lord God four, Lord God five, Lord God six, Lord God seven, Lord God eight, nine, and ten, eleven, Lord God twelve. Now that has set up the name of the Lord, hasn't it? Whatever you want to, I don't want to get into names and what they mean and everything, but it's shown that we will now address this God with respect. Now you watch how cunning works. The, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, now remember, it's supposed to be the Lord God. And let me remind you of a proverb that says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. The name of the Lord. When you are speaking about somebody behind their back and you go, say his name's John Smith. You go, oh, did Smith say? Did he really say? It's not, oh, could I just ask if John, John said, you know, just want to check. This isn't like that. This is undermining. This is taking away respect. The respect. It's undermining the respect given by way of being the creator to God. And the devil said to the woman, has not the Lord God, but has God. And the Bible's got a lot to say about undermining the people that are important in our lives. But somehow or other, this form of cunning bred in the sinful and evil, evil nature that we have incrementally undermines the respect that we need to have for the people Of the majesty of God. And it was a crossroad for the woman. It was up to her to go, hang on a sec, it's the Lord God. Now I would have loved for the answer to be, oh no, hang on a sec, it's the Lord God. And there's more to this, but I've run out of time. I'm so sorry, I have run out of time in this first talk. If you would like to join me for the second talk, I'd be pleased to have you with me as we find out the reason behind religious 